The sea covered the salt marsh, then flowed over the sea wall and flooded parts of the parking lot, a popular lookout locally. It carelessly tossed discarded coffee cups and fast food trash that danced and rolled as the ripples came in. There was an old fellow stood near me, his hands deep in his pockets, taking it all in. I thought he was stuck on pause or something because he barely moved. He just stood watching. Then he animated, like an intruder light suddenly flicking on in the dark. I've lived here 87 years, he said, presumably to me, and this is the highest I've ever seen it. Something ain't right somewhere. Seen them all, have you? I said, genuinely interested. I suspected that he probably had. Son, watching the tide go up and down is what passes for entertainment in these parts, and when it's a big one like this, the whole town comes out to look. There'll be more, but some have already gone. Seen the signs. Not me. I was born here and I'll die here, and when I see God, I'll tell him what assholes we've all been. There was no need for this. Then, with some difficulty, he climbed into his shiny new truck and thundered off. It was the highest I'd ever seen it too. Not that I had much historical tide-watching to draw on. We'd not been on the island that long, and the sea was still a novelty for us. It hadn't been a hard choice to finally leave the prairies when the time came. Penny was a bit teary, but it was for the best. It had become very toxic there, almost as if they were putting something in the water that was making some people crazier than usual. Realising that we had to move, we'd looked on the websites every night, in lots of places, but folks either weren't selling or they were out of our range. Then a friend, who'd vacationed on Deer Island on the south shore, met someone who was moving his mum to a care home in Manitoba and he wanted a quick sale, private. We got straight in, paid a fair price in cash, and it was ours. Our old place sold in the blink of an eye. I often wondered why. I think getting the house the way we did made it easier for Penny to make the move. She always needed an anchor, a place of her own, and the new house was it. This was to be our new forever home. The house was smaller than our old place, but that was okay. We'd save on heating, and besides we'd sold a lot of our things before we moved. Penny agreeing on condition we bought a fancy range and washer. The new place had plenty of land all round, but one neighbour, with the permission of the old lady that used to own it, had hacked down most of the trees around for firewood. In return, he'd mowed her grass for her, mowed it to near death twice a week by the looks of it. I noticed this seemed to be the way with the grass locally. The move-over was done in four days flat with a couple of U-Hauls. My brother, Clemens, helped, but his wife, Sue, didn't want anything to do with it. She didn't approve of our moving and she could be very vocal about it whenever she got the chance. In many ways, she was typical of the things we wanted to get away from. She could be very anti-things, sensible things, including Canada. Penny followed us in the car as we lumbered along. At least she had the dog for company. The dog had been sick for a while and we thought she might even pass before we moved, but she'd hung on, determined. It just meant that we'd need to find a local vet until the time came. She died in her sleep, a week after moving. Penny swore she'd hung on just to keep her sane on the drive over. The house needed work. We expected that. What we didn't foresee is that nobody was available locally to do any, so we did everything ourselves. I've always been handy, and Penny has a way of looking at things and figuring them out, doing what's for the best. She's always been very pragmatic about everything. I envied her that ability to think like that. I don't know how I'd manage without her. Badly, I think. The wood-cutting neighbours we'd inherited are fine in that insular island kind of way. They smile and say, hello, and the woman, I didn't get her name, brought us some stuff from her church as a gift. I laughed about it with Penny, saying that she was almost as if she was competing to get her brand of Baptist theology in there first. I was right. Several more church types dropped over the next few weeks, each wearing the same fixed smile, bearing an assortment of trashy things. We knew how it all worked. We were both from small communities originally, the sort of places where everyone knows everyone else, including all their business, and what happens when the door closes and the curtains are shut. They also know how far they could throw them, as my nan used to say. I was never sure what she meant, but I think I know now. We went to the nearest church at first, for convenience really. It's a bit like an old people's club in there, but we stuck it out for a while, listening to their good intentions. I'm sure most were sincere. I only went for Penny's sake, she's the more devout. 
In fact, I don't really go for any of it now. We soon found out that there was a fierce rivalry between the churches. It wasn't very Christian at times, but, as one prim old lady said, at least it was the fellow Baptists we were hating. We don't even talk about the Catholics. I think Penny would have kept it up, but after the pastor spouted all sorts of rubbish about the world, vaccines, people living their lives, I refused to go back. She went a few times, but got fed up of being hit on by one old guy who thought he was God's gift because he had money. In the end, I went with her one last time, and we had words, him and me, after. We never went back. Inside twelve months, we were blessing the day we'd moved. A friend back in the prairies reckoned the place had gone feral. Law was limited to non-existent, and they'd had really bad floods. Biblical rain, he called it, followed by unprecedented tornado activity, which easily ripped everything up from the sodden ground. They were lucky, their house was on one of the few hills around. Lots died, many lost everything, and some were looking around trying to take land or property for their own. I think my friend would have shot anyone who tried it with them. I know I would. I heard they died when their house burned, but nobody would investigate it. That was where they were now. Clemens stopped answering the phone. I reckon that Sue will be telling him not to. I don't know what happened to them. They were on low ground, which he loved because he had a big pond out back and he'd shoot ducks. It seemed a waste to me. Sometimes he didn't even eat them. I asked him why, but he had no answer. We're very different people, Clem and me. But he's family, so I should have been more concerned about his fate than I was. I checked online, naturally, but it was a mess out there and I didn't try to get in touch again. Clem did what his wife wanted to. They'd probably paid a high price for that. I love Penny, and I know she'd never asked me to do anything that wasn't necessary. Important. We know each other, how we think. We're a team. Life was settling down and we seemed to be doing okay. Then the fire happened, caused by idiots clearing ground and burning in a woodlot. The ground had been tinder dry for a while. It seemed to be either a deluge or a long drought here, with no happy medium. Oh, and foggy. Thick, impenetrable fog. Burning in a drought makes you question just how much shit for brains some people have. The answer was a lot. The fire and the authorities' attitude to it was just one of the many things that made us wary, especially when guns went off at night. People had home invasions, and we know that they weren't always reported. It was almost unheard of, part of a change in people. They were getting more and more antsy for nothing at all. That people were now being assaulted and things stolen was a direct contradiction of what we knew of the place. Anti-government flags everywhere, strange allegiances and a general mistrust of anything federal seemed to spark the change, not just here, but everywhere. Our area became almost lawless. It was only the general decency of most of the locals that stopped it being worse. On seeing where things were headed, we kept ourselves to ourselves, fenced our property properly and nobody bothered us. When the fire was at its worst, we had a mandatory evacuation, advance warning, and so we got ready, but it was pretty clear that we were the only ones on the island taking any notice. When the evacuator alert sounded, a hundred or more trucks stopped on the causeway blocking it, cutting us off. A clear statement of intent. It had obviously been pre-planned and nobody was getting on and nobody was getting off unless by air or sea. The fire lasted in a month and took out 70,000 hectares, destroying innumerable properties and animals. It reached the shore not two kilometres away from us and we watched it burn right down to the tide line. There was quite a crowd spread along the road following its progress. I was amazed, but not surprised, when someone lit a fire in a local parking lot, the smoke being used to try and keep the billions of black flies at bay. It didn't. In the third week of the burn, when confirmation of the news of how it happened came out, the men responsible were found chained to a tree. They'd have probably survived the beating if they had been found in time, but the fire had turned on a wind change and swept their way, pushing back the few firefighters that had stayed with us, local guys. The arsonists paid the highest price possible for their stupidity, victims of mob justice, but nobody locally thought anything wrong had happened. For once I had to agree. Before the incident, the news reports had said the fire crews here had been pulled off because a large area near the big city, Halifax, was in flames. We were left to our own devices, 
and people were saying that the lynching, because that is what it was, had been held off until nobody was there to stop it. It was a salutary lesson on the local mindset, something to be aware of, wary of. People were friendly if guarded, but don't piss them off because they've all got guns in their trucks and homes. And then it rained. I'd seen rain lots of times, big rainstorms, dumping water and causing flash floods, gutters overflowing and roads turned into rivers. After long hot spells in the prairies, rain had been refreshing and, if there was no lightning, Penny and I would dance naked in our yard in celebration. Nobody could see us and we'd let the rain soak us through, it was liberating. What we got here was dark rain, wet stuff nobody would dance in. It was rain like we'd never seen before. Soon some roads were being washed out, unsuspecting drivers suddenly finding the road gone and the truck in a swirling maelstrom. Then houses floated off in rivers, seemingly racing each other to the sea before being torn apart, joining the build-up of trash that was dumped by wild seas on our scenic shores. And yet people still cut their lawns, even though everywhere was quagmire. In a way it was funny to see the ride-on mowers poking out of some new swamp, We laughed at it, but it was serious, not normal. Our causeway became a mass of sinkholes as the dodgy fill they'd used left for good. They had to fix up a one-way system for getting over, but lots of trucks ignored it, and more than one case of road rage ended badly. Where we were was like everywhere else. There was a lot of resentment towards the authorities. These were the same people most had always voted for. The changes we were seeing locally seemed to be taking place everywhere in Canada and the States. Everybody was getting serious issues in one form or another. And everybody was getting angry about it too. Nobody seemed reasonable. Somebody else was always to blame. And still it rained, almost continuously. In places right on the old floodplains, long since paved, large areas were gone for good as the lakes breached and just kept rising. Food became scarce in some parts after so much land, green belt needed for food production, had been sold for development, lining the pockets of those who allowed it. Now what crops were growing struggled because of the weather and everything had to be brought in, if we could find it. It got harder, most places need to feed their own first, I can understand that, but some were selling the food from under the country for obscene profit and they didn't care who knew it. Then the rain stopped and people calmed down a bit. Mm -hmm.